We are continuing today to look at the I am's of Jesus and in particular the I am the door. I want to draw our minds back to the scripture. Jesus says, I'm the door of the sheepfold. And for the last couple of weeks, we have looked at the door that the Israelites entered into on the first Passover and the door they came out of in what I believe is speaking into entering into Christ and coming out in newness of life. You shall go in and out and find pasture, Jesus says in John 10. And you can go back and look at those last two recordings if you want, or you can write me and I can send them to you in an audio file. I have them in an audio file. They're posted on Facebook in a video file, and it deals with particularly that door. Now, we're going to move on in the door in this lesson. And I wanna draw your mind to a very particular door in the scripture. And that door is the veil of the temple. That's where I wanna draw our mind today into the door that is the veil of the temple. And as we begin to draw our mind there, I want us first off to go to Exodus 15 and 17. And this is these Israelites that have come out of Egypt and they're on the journey to Canaan land and, and they come across the Red Sea. And in Exodus 15 and 17, the Bible says, Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Amen. So set before the people of God, after the defeat of Pharaoh's army, is God's desire to bring them in and plant them in the sanctuary that his hands have established in, in, in the place where he dwells. So, so here in Exodus 15, we get this picture that God has desired a people to come to a place where he dwells at. Well, in, in the book of Exodus, Moses, the prophet Moses, goes up into the mountain, and most of us know the story of the Ten Commandments, and he receives the Ten Commandments of the Lord. But he also receives the, the word, the instructions to build the tabernacle of God. He receives the instructions of the priesthood. He receives the instructions of the feast days. He receives the oracle of God. And in that oracle, in that word that comes out of the Lord, Moses brings the people into covenant, into a blood covenant. And it's in the it's in the book of the, of of Exodus. You can read read it through about I don't know, chapter seventeen through probably the end. <laughs> and so, what is set before the children of Israel is is this tabernacle, these words of covenant, these ordinances, these feasts, and the priesthood. So God has brought them out of Egypt through the door. And we talked about this for the last couple lessons. They didn't come out of Egypt without going into the door, the door that had the blood on the lentil, the door 
there in Egypt that I believe speaks of our Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Jesus says in the book of John, they shall go in and out and find pasture because they entered into that door to come out the Israelite in the newness of life. So they entered that door to come out in the newness of life. And they're on their way to Canaan land. And in the in Canaan, you know, God is going to plant them in the mountain of his inheritance. And we later on, if we study the Bible, we see that that's Mount Zion. And that place for him to dwell in, in the sanctuary of the Lord, which thy hands have made. And ultimately in Jerusalem, there's a temple built and a sanctuary set up and God dwells in that sanctuary. But, but as they're on their way to that permanent dwelling of the Lord, the, the, the temple of God in the old covenant, God sets before them a tabernacle. God gives the instructions to Moses, and Moses just didn't come off the mountain and decide to build God a tabernacle. It was, it was specific. Every detail had to be perfect. In Exodus 26, verse 30, the Bible says, And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which have been showed thee in the mount, and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen, with cherubim, the work of the skillful workmen, shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it up on four pillars of Achaia overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon four sockets of silver, and thou shalt hang up the veil under the clasp and thou shalt bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall separate unto you between the holy place and the most holy. So, so the veil in that tabernacle and later on in that temple was a veil of separation. And it was signifying, I believe, a separation of God from the people. So the people couldn't enter into the presence of God as long as the veil was there. And God says in Exodus, speaking of the most holy place, and, and uh, here will I meet with thee. So, so God met with Israel in the most holy place. So what I'm referring to is actually Exodus chapter 25. And in Exodus chapter 25, verse 21, it says, Set the mercy seat atop the ark and put the testimony that I will give you into the ark. And I will meet with you there above the mercy seat between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. So God met with them in that temple. That was the meeting place of the Lord. That's what it, what it was. It was where they come to meet with God. They didn't come just in a religious atmosphere. They come to meet with God. God was there. He told them he was going to dwell there. And so, but he was veiled from them. So although God was there, he was behind the door. He was behind the veil. And the high priest one time a year could enter into the veil on the day of atonement and make atonement for the sins of the people. But the people could never enter into the presence of the Lord. Now, the presence of the Lord was with them. God was with them. 
And a lot of Christians, I, I, I many times want them to just get a hold of this fact that God was not a million miles up in the sky. Now, he may be there too, but he was traveling with the Israelites out of Egypt as a cloud, in that cloud and fire, God, the Jehovah God was traveling with them. It, it tells you that all the way through the book of Exodus, I believe Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you can find it. And the Ark of the Covenant will go on to represent the very presence of God in the Old Testament. So here, this living God is in their midst, but he's veiled. He's veiled. And he said in Exodus, it's written in the book of Exodus, God, God spoke and said, I have heard the groaning of my people, Israel, and I have come down to deliver them up and out of Egypt into, into a land flowing with milk and honey. So he come down to bring them into Canaan land, into the place of his habitation, to the place where he would be their supply. It's what all the milk and honey represents. And I know it, it probably has a greater even understanding than that, but it's the supply of God. So he, so he brought them from the taskmaster to where he is their exceeding great reward. And, and he brought them there through a door. And then here's this door in their midst, another door. <laughs> or doors, actually. You have the door or, to the courtyard. Because the tabernacle is set up with the courtyard. In the courtyard, you have the brazen altar. And you have the brazen labor. And then you have the first room in the tabernacle that has a door and you have an inner room that has a door or a veil. And in that veil is the very presence of the living God. And in the book of Exodus, when they reared up the temple, it's recorded in Exodus, Exodus 40. And start verse 1, Exodus 40, verse 1. We'll read a few places here. It says, And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month thou shalt rear up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and thou shalt screen the ark with the veil. Here again is the, the, the ark of the testimony and the veil. And thou shalt bring in the table and set in order the things that are upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlesticks and light the lamps thereof. And thou shalt set the golden altar of incense before the ark of the testimony. And put the screen of the door to the tabernacle. And thou shalt set the altar of burnt offerings before the door of the tabernacle of the tent meeting. And thou shalt set the labor between the tent of meeting and the altar. And thou shalt put water therein. And you can go and read the other articles that are put in the courtyard and in that area. You can go read the rest of Exodus here, but I'm going to skip down to verse 19. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle, and he put the covering of the tent above upon it, and as Jehovah commanded Moses. And he took and he put the testimony into the ark and he set the staves in the ark and he put the mercy seat up on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the bell of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as Jehovah commanded Moses. So Moses did what God had told him, what God had commanded him on the mount. Now verse 34 of this chapter says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of meeting because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward throughout all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they journeyed not until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Jehovah was upon the tabernacle by day, day and the fire therein by night. 
in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journey. So here's the presence of God among the Israelites. So, so these Israelites that came out of Egypt, they didn't, just didn't come out by Moses. God appeared to them in the cloud and fire and led them out. And here in the wilderness, as they've come to Mount Sinai, Moses receives the instructions of how to make the tabernacle, and they set forth the tabernacle, and the presence of God fills the tabernacle in a cloud. But that presence of God is veiled away from the Israelite. Now, as you go on down through the history of the Israelites in your Bible, you'll find in the book of Kings that between David and Solomon, King David has in his heart to build a house for the Lord. So he has a heart to build to build a dwelling place for the Lord, and and God doesn't allow him. He said, and he, God tells him, "Your son's going to build this house." And when he builds this house, again you have a temple and you have an inner sanctuary. And 1 Kings 6 and 16 calls the inner sanctuary the most holy place. And again, this same thing occurs when this temple is set forth. It says in 1 Kings 8, 6, And the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah into its place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubim covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And the staves were so long that the ends of the staves were seen from the holy place before the oracle, but they were not seen without, and there they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there in Horeb. When Jehovah made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, and it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud, the cloud, filled the house of Jehovah, or of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand and minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of Jehovah filled the house of Jehovah. So the glory of God fills the house, the inner sanctuary. So the children of Israel, the God they were worshiping, had made himself real to them, but they couldn't enter into the presence of him. Now, I, I set all this up because Jesus declares himself to be the door, I, I could say the veil. So he, when he comes on the scene, when Jesus comes on the scene, he begins his ministry at, I believe, 30 years old. And he begins to perform great miracles upon the earth. He begins to heal the sick. He raises the dead. Blind eyes see, deaf ears hear, mute mouths speak, lame legs walk. There's nothing Jesus can't do. There's nothing he still can't do because he's God. So there's nothing he cannot do. So here we have this reality. He comes forth in man, and he tells those around him, and I believe it's multi recorded multiple times in the Bible, that the Father in me doeth the work. Now, this God of glory, who had filled the old covenant temple, and I believe if you study your Bible, when the first temple was destroyed and they build the second temple, the Israelites, I don't believe you see this same picture of the cloud of God covering that old temple house. But here Jesus comes on the scene and he declares God, the same God of glory, is now dwelling in him. Hallelujah. 
And he not only declares it, he proves it. He, he even tells them that this God is his witness. And the witness upon the earth wasn't just the words he was saying, but it was the miracles that he was performing. And, and you know, the disciples, when they were on the raging sea with Jesus, and he was laying asleep with them, and they woke him. And he speaks to the winds, peace be still. And they say something to the fact that never have they seen a man like this. And people, you know, the miracles in abundance. I believe John says you couldn't have even written it in the books. Books couldn't even contain all the things that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. But, but here in him is that God that was veiled to the children of Israel. Now, we'll set that forth because he told them the Father in me doeth the works. Just like with Israel, God wasn't a million miles up in the sky with Jesus. He was in him. He said, he that sent me is with me. In John 14, he says, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Else believe me for the very work's sake. Believe it because of what I'm doing. Don't you see the living God is in me? I believe that's what Jesus was telling them. God is in me. He's not far away. And here we, here we come, and yet he was veiled from the minds and the hearts of those that were there. And in Revelation chapter 4, John sees a door, a door in heaven. And it says in Revelation 4, 1, says, after this, look and behold, there was a door opened in heaven. Now, the Old Testament temple, if, you, if you'll go read some Jewish history, from what I've read, they believe that inner sanctuary represented heaven or was a heaven. And I don't know how you could even argue with it because if it contained the presence of God, <laughs> heaven is where he's at, right? So if the presence of God is there, in at least as much as I can comprehend it, heaven would have to be there. And, and in Isaiah, God declared, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And the place of his throne was in Jerusalem, was in that temple, that that Ark of the Covenant was the place of the throne of the Lord, and the place of his feet was in Jerusalem, was in that earthen vessel. That earthen vessel that it was in was the temple of God, and or the tabernacle of Moses as they wandered through the wilderness, and even when they first entered into the, the promised land until Solomon built the temple. So, so here we have God in a house, in a temple, but a people that don't have access. And Jesus comes along and he says, God is in me. And he makes just one of the most beautiful statements that when I, when I saw this by the Spirit of God that I've ever seen, at that day you'll understand that I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. Speaking of the day of the coming of the Spirit of the Lord in John 14. So this God that was in Christ was going to put us in Christ, and we were going to have access unto the Father. Hallelujah to the Lamb of the living God, and we're going to come through the door. And he says, I'm the door of the sheepfold. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He's the door. If you try to climb up some other way, you're not going to achieve it. <laughs> you come there through the door. And, and John sees and. Revelation chapter 1, he sees a door open in heaven, and, he, and then he hears a voice as a trumpet talking with him. And that voice says, come up hither, and I will show you the things which must be hereafter. And immediately, it says, and immediately he was in the spirit. So, so what he began to see 
after he was called up was by the Spirit of God, and, and he saw a throne set in heaven and one on the throne, and he that sat up on him was like a jasper and sardine, st sardine stone, and a rainbow round about the throne sight of an emerald. So here John sees the open heaven, and he sees a vision of God. Now, where else is that in your Bible? It's in Ezekiel chapter 1. And when John saw the open heaven, he saw a vision of God. And as you go through chapter 4 into chapter 5, in chapter 5, he sees the Lamb that's worthy to open the book. The Lamb that had been slain. Ultimately, in the heavenly vision, John sees a Lamb. And he sees a Lamb that's been slain. And able to open the book. And honey, I believe that's the book of life. I believe that's the new covenant that is opened unto us today. Just like the door that's opened to us today to give us access to the presence of God. So, so John sees this lamb having seven horns and seven eyes, as it, you know, it says, as it had been slain, having the seven spirits of God. And those around the throne are singing a redemption song that he's redeemed us out of every kindred tongue and, and nation and made us a kingdom of priests unto God and his father. And, to, you know, and they're worshiping the lamb throughout eternity. And, and honey, I don't believe we're waiting on that to happen. A lot of people are waiting for that to happen, but I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm worshiping the lamb right now. And right now the lamb has given me access into the presence of God. So I'm not waiting to get access to the presence of God. The presence of God that was veiled away, I now have access through the lamb into the presence of God, into the heavenlies. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes, you are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, so to see into the heavenlies, we see through the open door by the Spirit. John immediately saw by the Spirit when he was called up, and, and the voice that called him up, the voice of the trumpets, he's going to see the things you know, that are hereafter, and he was immediately in the spirit. That's where he's immediately at. And he's seeing by the spirit of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Now that's something. That's something to get a hold of. Now I want to ask you, where are open, where are open doors open in heaven in your Bible? Well, there's a number of places. Like I said, Ezekiel chapter one, and and I love Ezekiel chapter one because he 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 says. I have to turn there. So if you're following along in your Bible, turn there. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, but as I was among the captives, and here like the children of Israel back in Egypt, here with Ezekiel, their captive. And he was among, among the captives at the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw. Sounds a lot like John. John saw visions of God. What did he see when the heavens were open? He saw visions of God. That's what I believe the open heaven is about, is seeing visions of God. Don't know if you've thought about that. And that word vision, if you look it up, it has a unique meaning. And when I say a unique meaning, it, it means just that. It means a vision and also a mirror, a mirror. And I may get into that in a moment, but we will see. If not, I probably will next week. So that'll give you something to pull you back. I'll, I'll mention it most likely. But here, 
Ezekiel sees a visions of God. And, and ultimately, if you read all of chapter one, you come to the end of the chapter. It says, verse 25, and there was a voice above the firmament that was over their heads. When they stood, they let down their wings, speaking of the cherubim. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Here's the throne again. As the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the was a likeness as the appearance of a man upon it, it above. And I saw as it were glowing metal as the appearance of fire within it round about from the appearance of his loins and upward and from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. So this man had the appearance of fire. And there was brightness round about him. And my heart just went scream out the Holy Ghost and fire. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud of the day of rain, so is the appearance of the brightness round about it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Jehovah. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So here again, you see similar to the apostle John, an open heaven, a door open in heaven. And, and you hear a voice and you see visions of God. And now when Jesus is baptized in, in the Jordan, it's recorded in the book of Mark, in the book of uh, Matthew and probably other places, but I'll read it out of Mark. And it's Mark chapter one and Matthew chapter three. He says, in those days, Mark one nine, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in Jordan, immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son in whom in you, I am well pleased. King James says, in whom same thing in you or in whom I am well pleased. God is pleased in Christ. You are my son. So the declaration from heaven is that Christ is his son. And here is where God is pleased. And the open heavens begin to declare the living Christ. And this, I believe, is the mirror or the vision of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God is the declaration of Jesus Christ. Apostle Peter in, in Matthew 16, when, when Jesus says to them, whom do men say, I, the son of man, am. And the disciples tell him, well, some say you're Elijah, some John the Baptist, you know, some of the other prophets, and some, some John the Baptist. And Jesus said, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and, he, and Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So here the heavens are open at the baptism of John the Baptist and a declaration comes of the Christ, thou art my son in whom I'm well pleased. There's the vision of God, seeing the son of God. See, Jesus told, told us, if you've seen me, you've seen the father also. He told us in his word that the son declares the father. So the way that we see what God is, the way that we see the heavenly things is we see that through Jesus Christ being revealed by the Spirit of God. Because that's what the Spirit of God does. It reveals Christ. And Christ operates, I believe, like a mirror. That we look at Christ by the Spirit and our souls and minds are transformed to what we see. Now, this is a process. This is an ongoing process. And we like things instantaneous, especially in the culture today. We have Big Macs and we have Burger Kings and all, all these things we have in the natural, and we want them instantaneously, and we want that with God. But with God, it's this continual process that we come in and we eat his flesh and we drink his life, and he's filling us full of his of his life. We, just, we eat his flesh and drink his blood, and we're being filled with his life. And it's this continual process as we feast on the Lord. So here, as the heavens are open and we see Jesus by the Spirit of God, we are changed. 
Glory to the living God. Because that door is open. It's open and it come up hither and I'll show you the things which must be hereafter in John's immediately in the spirit. Apostle Paul says of you and I, you're no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of God dwells in us. Well, he's wanting to show us the things like John 16 says, the things that are to come. Now, I know what our minds do with that, the things that are to come, the things that are way out here in the future going to come someday. And I've said this before, but I want you to turn with me to John chapter 16. In fact, I could probably read John chapter 16 every week. In John 16, Jesus says to them, Verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all the truth, for he shall not speak from himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, these things shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. Here's the things I believe in my heart that are coming, he shall glorify me. For he shall take a mind and shall declare, he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take a mind or of me and declare Christ unto you. That's what happened with John the Baptist. The spirit come down like a dove, a voice out of heaven, Thou art my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's what happened with Peter. My God, that's the open heaven. And we see him to be changed into the same image by the Spirit of God. I mean, that is salvation. People never told me this when I was a kid. They, they told me what heaven, how wonderful heaven was going to be. Scriptures like I haven't seen or haven't heard never entered into the heart of man. And I'll, I'll say that never entered into my heart that he was going to be revealed in me and my soul was going to be transformed into the same image of him. And there is nothing greater than that. I'm telling you nothing. than my soul and mind to be transformed into the image of the living Son of God, into the image of the living God, that Christ would be revealed. And I would see him by the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost coming to declare him, glorify him at. Where do you think he's glorifying him at? In his temple. Where did, where did the glory of God appear at in the Old Covenant? In his temple. Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it again. This said he was speaking of his body. And when he come out of that tomb, he raised it up. Apostle Paul declares, now you are the body of Christ. So where do you think the glory is going to appear but in his house? Now you are the house of God. He hath rent the veil when he was crucified. It's in Matthew 26. The veil was rent. The veil of flesh was rent. The veil was rent that had, that stood there in, in, in Israel that was signifying the Israelite could no longer, could not enter into the presence of God. Well, that veil was rent. The apostle writes in Hebrews that it was the veil of his flesh. And the veil of his flesh, I believe, was you and I because he was made in the likeness of man to die the death of the cross. And when that veil was rent in the book of Hebrews, it says it gives us access. It gives us access unto the living God. So you and I have access unto God through Jesus Christ. 
Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. A couple more scriptures. There, there's many I want to cover, but a couple more here, and uh, we'll pick up with this, Lord willing, next week. In Genesis, Genesis chapter 26 and verse 30, and this is Jacob, and it says, And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which have been showed thee in the mount, I'm reading Exodus, so excuse me. The book of Genesis, Genesis 28 and 10. So Genesis 20 and 10 says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted up on a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took a stone, one of the stones of the place, and he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. Now, that was a glorious stone to rest on a stone. That's what we rest on is a stone. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up from the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. This ladder from the earth reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, Jehovah stood above it and said, I am Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee whithersoever thou goest, and will bring thee again into the land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, surely Jehovah is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid. And he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. Now, here again is a door in heaven or a gate in heaven, an entrance way into heaven. And he saw there a ladder or stairway that set up from the earth and the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Now in John's gospel, a couple places in John's gospel, in John chapter, I believe, one, at the very end, it says, Jesus, verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite, Indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered, said unto him, Before Philip called thee when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee underneath the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see, thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you shall see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Here's how you ascend into the heights of heaven, is up on him. Because what's heavenly is in him. In fact, in John chapter 3, Jesus tells them in one place, no man hath ascended into heaven. This is verse 13. But he that descended out of heaven, even the son of man who is in heaven. As Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him hath eternal life. Now, in this discourse, of course, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he told Nicodemus, if I told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And he was talking about being born again to enter the kingdom of God, that that's heavenly. It's not of the earth. That's of the heaven. That's of God. If it's of God, it's of heaven. My God, we have this inner mind of heaven. Heaven's that of God. It's the abode of God. And we have the 
ability to know that of God right now. We don't have to wait to someday to die to go to heaven. It's been preached to us our whole life. When we die, we'll go to heaven. Well, you're dead, Paul wrote. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then you shall appear with him in glory. Christ who's in you. Colossians 1, he says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. This Christ that in you is going to appear within you. And you're going to appear with him in glory. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We have a salvation that's full of glory, glory. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. We have it in earthen vessels. <laughs> Not again an earthen vessel that, that Moses built. Not again an earthen vessel that the Israelites built, that King Solomon built, had built. We're the vessel. We're the vessel, the earthen vessel, that now the glory of God indwells. And we have access into the innermost sanctuary by Jesus Christ, the Lord, through the offering of his body to come into that of God, to know that of God, to dwell in the abode of God. What shall separate us from God? Whew. Glory to God. Apostle Paul tells us this in Ephesians 2, that we are built upon the foundation, the rock, the stone. You remember that? Jacob laid his head on a rock and rested. We're built upon a stone that can give you rest. We can rest on this stone. We can rest from the world. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We are built up, Paul says, for a habitation of God by the Spirit. It's in Ephesians 2. For the habitation of God. Christ is the Son over His own house, whose house you are. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What he is, the living God being made known in us, that's our salvation. That's it for eternity. They ain't going to quit. We leave these earthen bodies. Do we think it's going to stop? No. No, we're going to know him. We're going to know him. See, that's my heart's desire that I might know him. Glory to the Lamb of the living God. That's my heart's desire for you and I, for his body is to know him, to be filled with all fullness of the Lord. Well, we'll stop right here. We'll have to pick some of these things up and continue on. But as our great high priest, he entered in to the veil. Jesus did. Having fulfilled all the offerings, and rent it, giving us access that we could enter in through him, that we could enter in through his death, burial, and resurrection. What no other priest could do, our high priest did. He entered into the door, just like Jesus said in the porter opening. And then he says, he is the door. He gave us access. Access to all God is. And all God is is revealed in him. When He, you see him by the Spirit of God, you see the Father also. You see all that God is in Christ. That's all God is. That's what Jesus said. All things of the Father's, they're mine. So when I see him, I see that of God. And honey, he wants you to see him by the Spirit. Well, you said, well, no man can see God and live. Well, Paul said, we, we died with him. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I'm not talking about seeing him with our flesh and blood eyes. I'm talking about seeing him, that the eyes of our heart be enlightened in the knowledge of him, to see by the Spirit of God and be like John saying, I saw, and I saw, and I saw. Well, glory to God. May you have a wonderful, blessed day. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Amen.